I'm now going to move on to talk about structuring your argument. So this is going to be talking about the main body of your essay, okay, your main body paragraphs, which is where you're actually going to provide the evidence and to produce textual analysis and to actually prove your points, okay. Um, now it's important to plan this aspect of your essay, okay, so you'll actually plan out your paragraphs. You will actually know what you're going to say in each of your paragraphs and you can actually plot that. Um, if you like, it's almost like putting in the skeleton and then later on when you come to actually write your essay, you'll be putting the meat on the skeleton. So when you come to actually write a particular paragraph, if say, you know that it's about Wemmick, uh, who's a, that uh, character from Great Expectations, um, then you will know that that's what the paragraph is about and you can focus on writing that paragraph. That is a much better way around than how some students sometimes do it, is that they don't have a plan and they just make up the argument as they go along. Okay, Now that's much more stressful um, and you won't be able to focus on your actual writing and your actual textual analysis. So much, much better if you actually have that plan to begin with. Um, Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I'd also say it's worth spending potentially a day actually just planning your essay. It's worth spending some real time. Quite often students don't get the marks that they deserve because they simply haven't spent enough time planning. Okay, before you do any writing at all, plan your essay. Break your essay down. Decide what it is that you're actually going to argue and then break that down into smaller sections which then become your paragraphs. Okay, and so you're moving into your body paragraphs, um, and you can structure these in different ways. Um, your body paragraphs will be based around uh, a, a particular topic or a particular theme, or in the example of the essay that we've been using, by character, okay. Um, and you can structure and order those different paragraphs in different ways, depending on what seems the most logical to you. Uh, so different ways you could do that, you could move from general information to more specific information. So you kind of focus down as the essay progresses. Uh, potentially you could go from your uh, weakest argument to your strongest argument. Okay. Um, another way of doing it might be to, uh, go, to go from the counter-argument to argument, so that you uh, begin your essay with the, uh, the counter-argument, um, which is perhaps that you're quoting a particular critic who gives a certain view of great expectations, and then you spend the second 50% of your essay uh, giving your point of view, which is maybe different. Now, there's lots of different ways of structuring um, an essay, and the best person who should actually decide that is yourself, because you're, you know what it is that you're going to argue. All I would say, really, um, is that you need to have actually thought about this. You need to have actually made sure that your structure of your essay actually makes some logical sense. There is some logic to it. You have actually thought about it. Okay. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about using critics because it's in the main body of your essay where you will use critics and critics are very, very important and I suppose it's one of the ways in which university is perhaps slightly different to some of the previous forms of education you've had um, because you, it's much more important that you give some kind of critical context for the texts that you are looking at. Now, uh, critical, not that you will not have ever used critics before, but it will not have the same level of importance, perhaps, as it does at university. Now, critical information is really important. Using critics is important because it shows that you've read around the topic, okay? It gives you some sense of authority and credibility. Um, and you can also use critics to actually structure your argument as well, both on a wider macro level and on a smaller micro level uh, at the at level of the actual paragraph, okay? Um, now, sometimes students are a bit intimidated by critics because critics write I guess in a particularly academic way, and critics are in a sense not usually writing for students, they're normally writing for other academics, and so it can be quite impenetrable sometimes. Um, and for that reason, students sometimes feel a little bit intimidated by critics, and sometimes feel that they have to always defer to what the critic says. The critic is obviously very intelligent and must be right. What I would say is make sure that you're not deferential to critics, okay? You want to use critics rather than being used by them. Okay.
Um, and you can use critics in a variety of ways. Okay. Uh, the first way that you might want to use critics, as I've already suggested, is potentially to disagree with them. Okay. So uh, an example would be, um, while Eagleton suggests X, I argue that Y is the case. Okay. So uh, you're, you're using Eagleton as a kind of sounding board to go against, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, so this is a very good way to structure your argument, as I've already suggested. Um, the second way that you might use critics is to actually agree with them, so to actually support your argument, to lend some critical credibility to a point that you're making. The third way that you might want to use critics, and this is, if you like, sort of an amalgamation of the first two, is to finesse your argument. Okay. Um, so uh, while Eagleton is correct about X, his discussion of Y neglects A and B. Okay, so he's not saying it's not black and white. You're not saying that the critic Eagleton is wholly right or wholly wrong. What you're saying is he's right about some things, but wrong about others. Okay, uh, and if you like, that's probably the most sophisticated of the three. But what I would say is it's important probably to use a variety of these methods, to use critics in an essay in probably each of these ways at least once. Okay. Okay, now it's important when you're using critics to always give reasons as to why you agree or disagree with them. Okay, um, you need to provide evidence which will be from your primary material. So it's not good enough to just say Eagleton is right, you need to say why Eagleton is right. Or it's not good enough to say that Eagleton is wrong, you need to say why you think that he is wrong. Um, and it's also important, particularly when you're disagreeing with a critic, that you actually, that you actually give a fair representation of their views, okay? So you don't want to say that, I don't know, Eagleton argues that the Earth is flat, and then you go on to suggest that the Earth is not actually flat. Now, you'd be right about that, but you wouldn't be giving a fair representation of Eagleton's views, okay? And that would, again, be picked up by the marker. Um, so you don't want to set up what's called any straw men arguments, where you just set up an argument that no one has actually made in order to knock it down. Okay, um, so we're talking about the structure of arguments, um, and it's important to realise that arguments do actually have a structure. Um, they have a conclusion that is built upon a premise, or rather a series of premises. Okay, so let's look at a very famous uh, example from the realm of philosophy. Um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Okay, and what you can see from this argument is that premise one and premise two go together to make up the conclusion. Now, this is obviously a very simple version of an argument, and your arguments in your essays will be longer and more extended than this. Um, but nevertheless, your, your arguments will have the same basic structure. It's almost mathematical, you know, premise one plus, plus premise two equals the conclusion. Um, okay, so how do you know that you've actually got a strong argument and that your argument actually works. Okay, so your argument is valid so long as it follows two conditions. So firstly, your premises must be correct, okay, they must be true. Uh, so if the first premise in the example we looked at was all men are immortal, then clearly the conclusion wouldn't work because that isn't true. Uh, the second condition is that your conclusion must follow on from your premises, okay. So if the argument that we looked at is all men are mortal, Owen is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Well, that is true, but it doesn't, it's not actually been proven by the argument. The premises don't actually lead to the conclusion in that example. Um, Okay, now um, let's turn back to the example of the Great Expectations essay that we've been looking at, um, because this might give us an example of uh, how this would actually work. Um, so the student would need in the Great Expectations essay to analyse each of the character's actions to prove that they act ideologically. Now remember, ideologically according to the definition of an ideological act, which we saw from Marx. Um, so that would be each of the paragraphs. would go through the different characters and would show the ways in which characters act ideologically. The second thing that this essay would have to do is it would have to make sure that the conclusion follows on from the premises. And one of the aspects of this would be, well, are the characters actually representative of the novel as a whole, or are there any potential gaps? Well, actually, there are some potential gaps, because uh, if you think about the novel Great Expectations, um, or for those of you that haven't read it, there are actually 
many female characters in Great Expectations. Uh, Miss Havisham is a, is a famous example. And this essay hasn't said that it's going to talk about any female characters. So what is that suggesting? That only male characters act ideologically and female ones don't? Um, so that is potentially a problem. Okay, so now we're going to look at the final section of the lecture, which is common argumentative flaws. Okay, so let's look at different argumentative flaws. Um, so uh, these are things that you might, potential traps that you might fall into. So they're things that you need to be aware on of and to make sure that you don't do. Um, now, the first one is failing to consider other sides of the argument. You could argue that this is a form of indoctrination. It's like you've got blinkers on and you don't want to look either left or right. Uh, now, this, is, this could be the case, for example, if you're trying to make a particular political point. Um, now, you, it, there's nothing wrong with writing political essays, but you do need to make sure that you're considering other points of view and that you're not letting a particular political philosophy actually affect your essay to make sure that you're not turning it into proper propaganda, for example. Um, now, the second argumentative flaw that people fall into is not actually providing any evidence to back up their claims. Um, so this is the difference between an assertion and an argument, okay? Uh, both are saying that something is true, but an assertion merely states that it is true. An argument backs this assertion up with evidence, okay? So that's the difference. Um, the third uh, common argumentative flaw is unsupported generalizations. Um, and I would just, to, to give a generalization, I would just say that you should never generalize, okay? Because even if your generalization is true, it may, quite often you end up not providing any evidence, whereas it's always better if you're providing evidence and you're as specific as possible. Okay, the fourth common argumentative flaw that students often fall into is what's called conflation. Now, conflation is a technical term that you may not have heard before. It means the combining of different ideas together so that you pretend, almost, that they are the same thing. Now, often these ideas are related ideas, and they might be quite similar ideas, but nevertheless, they are still distinct, okay? They are not the same thing. So, say, if you want to prove uh, point A is true, but you don't actually have the evidence to show that point A is true, you do, however, have the evidence to say that point B is true. Now, point A and point B, they're not exactly the same, but they're pretty close, and there's definitely a relationship between them. Uh, so what some students will try and do in this circumstance is, is, they, will say, uh, is they will conflate point A and point B. And they will say B, in other words, A, or B, that is to say, A. Let's have a look at how this would work in our example essay so that it makes a little bit more sense to you. Okay, so let's look at an example of conflation uh, from the essay that we've actually been using as an example. Um, so, this is an example of conflation. 19th century literature, or in other words, literary realism, is more concerned with objectivity than is the modernist literature of the early 20th century. Okay, now what the two terms that have been conflated here are 19th century literature and literary realism. Now, those two terms are related, okay? There was a lot of literary realism during the 19th century. However, not all literature in the 19th century was literary realism, and there certainly is literary realism after the 19th century. So they are not the same. So what this paragraph has done has conflated the two. And it seems to suggest, or it's, it's arguing, that 19th century literature as a whole is more concerned with objectivity than is modernist literature which is a, a quite a shaky claim, and much more shaky than saying literary realism. Um, so the, the fifth common argumentative flaw I want to discuss is what's called begging the question. Okay, now begging the question is where you have an assumption buried into what is a premise that you are using to try to prove your conclusion. Okay, um, so it's when you've got a conclusion hidden within the premise and when a statement that is only presumed to be true is used to actually back up an argument. Okay, a famous and somewhat misogynistic example of this uh, would be if somebody came up to me and asked, are you still beating your wife? 
Uh, now, there is no way that I can actually answer that question that doesn't in some way incriminate me. Now, clearly if I say yes, I am still beating my wife, well, that's not very good. Um, and if I say no, I'm not still beating my wife, well, that's not very good either, because it suggests that I have at some point in the past beaten my wife. Uh, now, uh, that question is begging the question. There is an assumption built into the question. Now, um, clearly that example is not going to be in your essay, but you can often tell when you're begging the question because you see use certain stock phrases. Uh, now, one of those stock phrases would be, we must remember that such and such is true. Um, so, let, we must remember that Margaret Thatcher was the greatest prime minister we've ever had. Now, the, the issue with that uh, phrase, we must remember that, um, is that it assumes that your reader already agrees with you. Okay. Um, now, uh, another potential uh, phrase that you might use is, it is obvious that X is the case. Okay? Um, so it's obvious that Margaret Thatcher was the greatest Prime Minister ever, or it is manifestly clear uh, that Margaret Thatcher was the greatest Prime Minister ever. Um, so uh, what, what those phrases do is that they negate the need for you to actually provide evidence. Now, again, it might be the case that, well, I don't know, maybe Margaret Thatcher was the greatest prime minister ever. Regardless of that, you still need to provide evidence to support your claim. Okay, so there's a series of questions that you need to ask your work. Um, so, are both my introduction and conclusion clear? Is my argument consistent? Have I contradicted myself at any point? Is the argument logically structured? Are my premises correct? Have I backed them up with evidence? And do my premises support my conclusion? Now, if you can answer yes to all of these questions, then you can be sure that you will have created an effective argument.